It's a great honor to be joined today by Dr. Richard Tremblay. Dr. Tremblay is an emeritus professor of pediatrics, psychiatry, and psychology at the University of Montreal, and one of the world's leading experts on the study of childhood aggression. He's received many honors and awards throughout his career, including in 2017, the prestigious Stockholm Prize in Criminology, what's been called the Nobel Prize in Criminology, for his work on studying the developmental origins of aggression and on early intervention studies to improve the developmental trajectories of delinquent children. Dr. Tremblay, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you, Adam. It's a pleasure to talk with you. It's a pleasure to have you here. So Dr. Tremblay, how did you first become interested in psychology? Um, originally, I uh, was a football and hockey player. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And I, um, I did a bachelor degree in, uh, in, in physical education. Uh, eventually, I went to work in a mental hospital and then with juvenile delinquents. Mm -hmm. And this led me to... How did you um, make that transition from phys physical uh, education to, to going to work with in, in that? Well... Um, I, I read a novel, <laughs> um, which uh, the title was Lilith. Uh, I don't remember who um, who wrote uh, this book, but he's a well-known um, American author. And at mm -hmm. the time, in the 1960s, uh, I read that book, and it um, it told the story of a recreational therapist falling in love with. Um, with a, uh, a patient in the hospital who invented a language. Um, from a historical perspective, Lilith is uh, someone who invented the language. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when I finished my bachelor in education, there was uh, an offer for a job in a mental hospital. And and so I, I was probably the only one in the in the graduates that had an idea what could be done in a mental hospital as a physical education teacher. So I applied and got the job, um, but I ended up working with uh, old schizophrenics um, who mm -hmm. uh, I could I. I I could take a, a basketball and they were all in their rocking chairs and have the, the ball go around <laughs> the mm -hmm. room, uh, but that was about it. So anyway, I, um, I told the head of the hospital that uh, I needed to more, I, do the, I needed to do a, a master degree in psychology to continue my work and they offered to pay my salary while I did my master degree. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was in the good time when um, there was a lot of baby boomers who, uh, <clears throat> who were coming into the system. Uh, and so um, I got free education for my master degree. I then worked with, um, uh, in a mental hospital for uh, offenders for, for most of the, of the men in that hospital um, <clears throat> had killed someone. So I worked there for three years and that was very interesting. But again, I felt that um, I needed to know more about who were the people I, were, I was working with. And, and so the University of Montreal offered me to uh, pay for my PhD and I went, I did my PhD at the University of London um, <clears throat> in educational psychology and I was lucky to find someone there who had worked in prisons. Uh, Robert Andrew was a, a professor and he was in charge of uh, training <clears throat> people who work with juvenile delinquents. And so I did my PhD um, on the treatment of juvenile delinquents 
in um, in four institutions in the London area, mm-hmm. and that that study where I was comparing the effectiveness of the interventions uh, for juvenile delinquents um, <clears throat> led me to uh, start doing research on the development of physical aggression uh, from early childhood uh, up to, uh, at first up to adolescence. When you um, were working at that mental hospital and, and earning your master's, did you originally intend to become a therapist or did you know you wanted to do research? Um, no, I, I was, um, I think that um, I started to think that um, I, I could do good research and, um, and I could do research that was useful when I did my PhD. Um, while I was doing my PhD, I, I realized uh, through my literature review uh, that there was a lot of uh, interesting things that we don't, we didn't know. Uh, and um, that, uh, I guess it, uh, it, it went well. And so it inspired me um, to continue to, uh, to do research. And so I, I went to the, I, I became a uh, junior professor at the University of Montreal. And at that time, um, that was in the early 70s, there was a, a lot of resources available f- to do research, uh, and they were sort of begging, begging us to um, to apply for the money. Um, so it was um, I I got a lot of resources, um, a lot of money to do my work. So it, it became very interesting to uh, uh, to ask yourself questions and to have the resources to uh, try to answer these, uh, these questions. Were those research initiatives, was it unique to your field in that it has potential benefits of, of like reducing criminality? Um, or was it, was it just more of a broad, the university wanted to learn more and, and had the resources to offer that? No, um, the, the basic interest was in, in trying to understand how we can prevent uh, all the problems that I saw in the mental hospitals in the mm-hmm. uh, having worked with uh, old uh, adults um, schizophrenics and then work with uh, mentally ill offenders who had killed people and then work with uh, understanding how we were treating juvenile delinquents. I mean, that brought to me so many questions about how do people uh, start having the, these, um, these problems and, and what can we do uh, to prevent those problems. Uh, so to, to a certain extent, uh, the, the teaching that I was doing was interesting uh, but my main focus was on trying to answer question, important questions uh, through research. Mm-hmm. So that's what drew you to the developmental angle, because by the time people are adults, it's, they're sort of already set in their ways? Yes, um, I, I guess that my training in uh, psychology at the master level and at the doctoral level um, gave me uh, enough information on human development to, to realize that uh, we needed to know much more about uh, the development of, uh, of, aggressive, uh, of aggressive behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess every step that I took uh, uh, was a step backwards in, in terms of human development. I, I work mm-hmm. first with very old schizophrenics and, and then relatively young 
criminal offenders and then adolescents. Mm. Uh, and so by uh, the time I went back to Montreal and um, was uh, able to ask for money to do research, it was clear to me that I needed to start with um, at least kindergarten children. Um, and mm -hmm. so my first, uh, my first study that I applied for was to follow uh, male kindergar kindergarten children uh, to understand from, um, I, I chose ch uh, schools um, that were in poor areas. Mm -hmm. and, and so I could, uh, uh, it was quite clear to me that uh, the future delinquents were in these kindergartens in, in low SES environments. And, and so my first funded research was um, following the development of uh, children from kindergarten and specific, specifically looking at um, those who were aggressive in, uh, in kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So you focused on that younger age group. <clears throat> Is that because they're more plastic and you hoped that there would be more room to, to potentially intervene and change their behaviors? Or was it just that it was an understudied age group at that time? Well, I, I, I thought that um, the, the aggressive kindergartners would become the juvenile delinquents. And so essentially my, my first focus was on describing the development from kindergarten onwards. Um, how do very nice kindergarten children become juvenile delinquents. Um, so that was the first focus, but rapidly while starting that study, I realized that I had a chance to um, experiment a preventive intervention. Um, uh, so I, I got more funding uh, to do a randomized controlled trial um, where uh, we randomly allocated the most aggressive kindergarten children uh, to a, um, an intensive uh, program of intervention and the others did not get this intervention. What does the in uh, intervention look like? Yeah, the intervention, uh, of course, I, I knew uh, the literature quite well uh, at the time, and I knew that some interventions had been done, um, but I, I thought that we needed um, <clears throat> highly intensive interventions to have uh, a long-term impact. Uh, so th the intervention included um, social skills training with highly uh, social peers. So we put together uh, the boys that were the most socialized of the group and those who were the less socialized of the group. And we did um, social skills training uh, over a two-year period. So it was a very intensive intervention. Mm -hmm. um, the intervention also included parent training. <clears throat> so we, um, the school psychologists went to the parents' home um, to, over a two-year period, uh, at least once every month um, to do uh, parenting training. And um, we also um, work with their teachers uh, to, to give support to, uh, to the teachers. Um, and um, well, it turned out uh, we had to wait uh, a number of years, but by, by adolescence, um, we showed that 
uh, boys who had received the training uh, were um, um, had less delinquency problems, but also had less problems with alcohol and drugs. And by the time they were age 24, we showed that an impact on um, um, uh, adult criminality. So the um, uh, the boys who received the intervention, um, less of them had a, a criminal record. Mm -hmm. And we are still following them, um, trying to see uh, if we will have, uh, if we will see impacts. Uh, they are now in their 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Wow. So on one hand, these, ex these studies must be very, very expensive, but you're also seeing impacts decades down the line that might be, that might be even saving money if compared to if these people wind it up in prison and you'd have to house them. Yes. Well, yes, it's, it's very clear that uh, we are not only helping them have, have a better life, uh, but we are also uh, saving a lot of money uh, to society by not having to incarcerate these individuals. And hopefully it should have an impact on the children that they have. Um, mm -hmm. Was this the first major study of this kind and intervention following, um, following children ac across the lifespan? Um, no, um, there, there have been uh, longitudinal and experimental studies um, done in the States, not with boys. Um, let me see. Yes, uh, yes, there, there, there have been. Um, there are two studies uh, that have been done um, with um, aggressive uh, children. I don't remember if it's in kindergarten or, or for first grade, but um, there are a f at least two that I can remember from that time um, that started approximately at the same time as, as we did mm -hmm. that have shown uh, long-term impacts. So this is somewhat related to the big nature nurture debate, like how much of our behavior is, is due to biological factors and how much of it is due to societal factors. And it seems like you're providing strong evidence for, for a large part of, of aggression, either being able to be socialized out of, or, but then I know some of your other work has, has sort of shown that aggress aggression is is there from the start and then it, it typically yeah. gets better over time even without these interventions. Yes, yes. Well, that, that's the second, <laughs> the other part uh, of the story. Um, so having done that, uh, that, that study with uh, aggressive, with children uh, in kindergarten, um, we, we were following a thousand boys. Um, and um, so the, the, the ones we did the intervention on were a very small part of, of that large sample. Mm -hmm. And um, the very interesting results that we had by assessing yearly um, the, the boys um, is that we saw that over time, um, the frequency of physical aggression was decreasing. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in my mind and in the mind of most people, um, the worst is happening in adolescence and early adulthood in terms of violent behavior. Right. And by what we were seeing with teacher reports uh, of aggressive behavior of these children and with self-reports uh, by the time that they were, I think, age uh, 14, 15, uh, we, we sort of draw the 
trajectories uh, of their aggressive behavior. And uh, we were amazed to see that the frequency of physical aggression was decreasing with age. Mm -hmm. um, of course, with age, we, we, um, we become taller and stronger and our aggressive behavior in adolescence is more scary than the aggressive behavior of a five-year-old who, who is small and, and not very, uh, it's difficult to, if he hits someone, it will hurt, but not as much as a 15-year-old who, who hits mm. someone. Um, <clears throat> so we realized that uh, physical aggression was coming down and I wondered if it was a, a specific problem of of Canadian children, of French Canadian children in Montreal. <laughs> um, but it it, uh, it led me to um, to start a new study, and we we started a, a study with uh, a few thousand um, pregnant women, um, mm -hmm. and we decided to follow children. Uh, from uh, pregnancy onwards, uh, and what, uh, by measuring many different things, uh, including physical aggression. And what we showed was that the frequency of physical aggression increases from uh, about uh, nine, ten months of age um, until uh, about three, four years of age, the peak in terms of frequency of physical aggression is uh, <clears throat> between three and four years of age. And then the frequency of physical aggression decreases uh, until, uh, until adulthood. That's where you get the uh, terrible twos. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, and um, people were talking about terrible twos, but people who are not specifically focusing on physical aggressions. Um, and, and so this, uh, this led me, I, I remember that when I realized this, uh, this um, phenomena uh, that I had my, I had the impression I had put my finger right in the middle of the essence uh, of human behavior, uh, that uh, <clears throat> we we all see adolescents and young adults as being the worst, uh, but uh, the terrible twos is true, <laughs> very true, and it to a certain extent it's it's like a joke. Um, we are. <laughs> Um, doing things that are uh, sort of adult-like, hitting others, uh, but we are small and we are not really hurting others. So mm -hmm. it, to a certain extent, it's like a joke, um, right. but it's, it's very serious. It's clear that those children who who do not learn to control their aggressive behaviors. They are the ones who have all these problems for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. um, so um, understanding the origins uh, of uh, aggressive behavior is, is extremely important uh -huh. for us to understand the importance of the early education of children and the meaning of uh, uh, meaning and origins of, of aggressive behavior. Mm -hmm. So I can think of sort of two pathways. One would be the case where everyone on average um, becomes less aggressive, including the most violent ones and people who are, who are um, delinquent are just Still, still as still violent, but just less so than they were when they're two. And then the other one might be something like most people get socialized out of their aggression, but some people get worse. And then just on average, it looks like it's still getting better. Does that make sense? 
So I'm wondering that the overall trend is downwards, but I'm wondering if there's a small minority that it gets worse in, or if it's downwards for everyone. Well, it's, it's downwards for everyone, but to, in the worst cases, uh, it does not go down um, as much, it doesn't disappear. Mm -hmm. And and so um, if the, 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 the most terrible two uh, hits uh, every uh, third child he meets, um, he may become uh, the very aggressive adolescent um, that will hit someone uh, once every week or it uh -huh. the frequency decreases uh, but the damage is, is worse. Uh -huh. um, that makes sense. And th there is a very nice study that has been that was done uh, in France and I, I was there on sabbatical and that's how I I saw the people who were doing these studies. They were filming kindergarten children. Um, they were etologists. They were interested in uh, human behavior and the origins of human behavior. Um, and um, the, anal the analyses of these uh, films uh, showed that um, there were, I, I'm not sure about the, the exact figure, but I think it was close to 25% um, of the interactions were aggressive interactions uh, around age, between age three and four. So between children or between a child and anyone, including like their parents or adults. No, the children within within the the daycare. Mm -hmm. So twenty five percent of the interactions among children in the in wow. the daycare. Uh, and, and there's so little that even as, now we just laugh about it. But yeah, it's, it's actually some a... form of, of dominance and aggression. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean you. you you don't see that in a group of adults. Yeah. Um, so it's it's quite clear that we <laughs> humans are are using their uh, are, are learning to aggress and not aggress uh, mm -hmm. during early childhood in the same way that we're we're learning to talk and and, and to do many other things. So you mentioned that these findings were a surprise and that the prevailing mindset at the time was that things get worse until adolescence. So how did, how did these findings change um, the field? What was the discussion going on at that time? Um, I, I remember that um, one, of, uh, one of the yeah, an American colleague who, who saw the results um, said, uh, and that, that was a, a criminologist um, who came to see me after a talk I, I had given at the meeting, showing for the first time the, those results. And he, he said to me, he said, you know, this changes everything if your if your data if it's replicated this changes everything in terms of our our understanding of um, uh, of criminal behavior and especially uh, physically aggressive uh, criminal behavior um, and, and another one who who didn't say anything in the in, in the meeting but came to see me afterwards and he said there must be something wrong with your data the, the, uh, you know I, um, I I remember that I was not aggressive when I was young and it's only when I was <laughs> nine or ten years old that I hit someone um, 
so th there was part of it was um, disbelief uh, that what we were showing in terms of uh, aggressive behavior before school entry was worth looking at. Um, that, was, that was baby stuff. <laughs> and right. serious things were happening when children were uh, starting, starting school. So you had these findings from a large study and you mentioned um, the, the other study looking at the videotapes and it, it does seem like they were replicated over and over again. Is that correct? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I... Um, the findings that, that young children are the most aggressive, those kept being replicated even in future studies, right? Yes. Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. So it started off as disbelief and then the evidence kept pouring in. And yes. how did that, what did that do? To your colleagues who, who didn't initially believe you? Um, well, I, I think that um, I haven't heard anyone <laughs> recently argue with, uh, with the, the, these uh, data. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it's, it's now part of the mainstream. Um, unless people are not following. Uh, well, yeah, that's, that's great to hear. If it's mainstream within the scientific community, maybe, but I, I think you were right to point out that in terms of true mainstream, like the average person, they probably still look at um, adolescents and think they're, they're the most aggressive, even by frequency. Yes, but there, there is some kind of disconnect. There is still this, some kind of disconnect between the fact that um, there, there is clearly this tendency for children, and it's mainly, we, we've been talking about males. Uh, I think it will, it's important to talk about uh, the girls also. Um, but the, there is, um, if, if, if we look at, criminology as a, a science, um, most criminologists are focused on adolescents and adults. And, and, and the developmental origins uh, of these problems is not an important focus. And there is still, um, um, belief um, mainly among sociologists that these problems are created by the environment. And mm -hmm. it, it's true that it's created by the environment, but it, that there are important environmental impacts. Um, but the developmental origins of aggression is, is clearly something that starts early, <laughs> that's uh -huh. very frequent early and decreases with time. And part, uh, a large part of the decrease is an environmental effect. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's clearly an important environmental effect that has impacts on brain development and, and even on gene expression. Mm -hmm. um, it's very surprising that the criminologists haven't focused more on young children because it seems like the later you go, the more so you might be treating a symptom rather than a cause. Yes, yeah. Uh, I guess most understand, but uh, it's, it's usually a, pro uh, a question of choice of who you like to work with. <laughs> uh -huh. If you don't like to work with babies, you you like to work with adults, you, you work with adults and, and mm -hmm. sort of deal with that. And whatever happened before is not important because you're try, trying to help adults. Uh, mm -hmm. so you, you talked about genetics. So how much of childhood aggression, if you know, is, is due to like biological temperament as opposed to maybe these other risk factors like growing up in an unstable environment? Yeah, well, that's, that's a very interesting and important question. And the way we answered uh, that question
question is using twins. Mm -hmm. um, so when we, we, we started a large uh, cohort of twins, so that was uh, my, I think my fourth <laughs> longitudinal study. Uh, and so this mm -hmm. is a, uh, a cohort of newborn twins, um, a thousand that we have been following um, from from birth, and in the way to identify to what extent it's genetic versus environmental is looking at the monozygotic twin and the dizygotic twins, mm -hmm. and to the extent that monozygotic twins uh, behave very much similarly compared to the dizygotic twins, those who do not share the same genes. So that's identical uh, versus fraternal? Yeah. Um, uh, so we, we showed clearly that there is a very strong genetic effect that monozygotic twins um, are uh, very similar in terms of their aggressive behavior, their, their physical aggressions. Um, mm -hmm. much more similar than, than those who are not genetically identical. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that there is a strong genetic effect on um, the propensity to, to use uh, physical aggression, um, stronger than for, uh, say, reading uh, the ability uh, uh, to, to read, um, uh -huh. but still there is an environment <laughs> and it's, it, although there is a strong genetic effect, there is also an important environmental effect. Uh -huh. So we can return to the environmental effects, but I think we should first lay out maybe two types of aggression because when you, th when you think about some people are more biologically disposed to, to be aggressive, that might sound like a bad thing, but then there's also, a, there's like uncontrolled aggression. And then there's aggression in the form of, you kind of channel it into maybe competition or sports or something healthy. There's, yes. a, there's a psychological term for that, isn't there? I don't remember what it is. So when you channel some, you're like your aggression I'm into- Being affirmative. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, so ha have you noticed a, a difference in that? Because maybe so that this aggressive impulse is partly biological, but then is it the way that it's expressed, whether that's healthy or unhealthy, that depends more on your environment? Yeah, well, that, that's a very good question. Um, are, are the aggressive behavior that we've been talking about uh, up to now is physically aggressive mm -hmm. behavior. Um, and, and um, your question is, is leading more towards uh, being affirmative and, and sort of being dominant and, uh -huh. and, and being able to master the environment rather. Um, that, that's another form of, of behavior. Um, and, and in some individuals, uh, using physical aggression and being uh, dominant in a group goes together, but uh, mm -hmm. a well-socialized dominant individual will, will dominate with words and, and ideas rather mm -hmm. than with his fists. Yeah, so the uh, idea is maybe those two are correlated. So for example, if yes. you take some of the most aggressive children, young children, some of them, the ones who don't get a handle on it, might go off to become criminals, but others might go off to become like lawyers or some use, use yes. keep that aggressive yes. impulse, but not use their fists. Yes, exactly. And we measured that um, in, in uh, when we had the children come to the lab, we, we had the children um, who didn't know each other interact in different activities for uh, for a few hours, 
and at the end uh, we had them um, talk about the others in the group uh, and so we this enabled us to measure what we can call leadership um, and so we, we would ask uh, if you met together again uh, this group of boys uh, who should be the leader and who should play another role so um, we, we did measure um, the, the leadership uh, dominance so dominance tendency and and we showed that there was a link with testosterone um, so we took saliva uh, and assessed the amount of testosterone and, and we published a paper on this showing that uh, the, the boys who were perceived as dominant um, that was around age uh, 11 uh, 10 11 um, mm -hmm. at higher levels of uh, of testosterone mm -hmm. so while we're talking about hormones this would be a great place to to bring in the sex differences talk about aggression in females yes, yes. Um, yes, well, um, this is two very different worlds. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so when I was saying that there are, there are a lot of physical aggressions uh, among kindergarten children, it's among the males, the males kindergarten children, uh, not among the females. So girls do not use physically physical aggression as often. Um, uh, as boys and by age three um, what we see is that they um, uh, we call it indirect aggression uh, they start um, um, telling others not to play with the girl that they don't like um, so uh, there is this assessment uh, of indirect aggression uh, among males and among females. And what we see from a developmental perspective, and, and we have assessed uh, a few thousand girls and boys, uh, it's quite clear that girls will use indirect aggression earlier in development. Um, let's say by by age three they have started to use indirect aggression while as boys do not they use physical aggression and, and with age uh, indirect aggression increases physical aggression decreases but indirect aggression increases mm -hmm. for both uh, girls and, and boys wow is the uh, does it increase more for girls or is it yes. at the same rate? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, the, the girls do it more. Um, I don't remember having really looked at the rate of increase, but mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at the trajectories, you see that girls are using it much more often and increasing as up to adolescence. So that peaks in adolescence and then it gets better. Well, we don't we don't have data after uh, late adolescence on, on indirect aggression. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's harder to uh, to get that from adults. Uh -huh. So physical aggression and talking about testosterone that that sort of makes a lot of biological sense. But do are there any um, any good theories for why indirect aggression emerges? Is it just that? aggression is always going to be there and if it's not physical it's indirect or is there something more more nuanced than that um i think i've never asked myself that question <laughs> <laughs> um it's um i mean is there a biological link to indirect aggression i don't know if someone has studied that Mm -hmm. um, there, there must be something, um, and it, it, but I, I, 
I really can't um, <laughs> can't say that I know. Um, it, it is an interesting question. Whether or not it's biological. I mean, I've I've learned from doing this show that the answer is always it's both. We just don't know how much is yes. how much is nature, <laughs> how much is nurture. But it seems like in the modern day you have cyberbullying and you have these forms of indirect aggression that are that are mediated through technology. And and in some sense it's become easier to to aggress indirectly through social yes. media. Yes, that's right. That's mm. right. Uh, and so, well, that's a study to be done because, um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to call a few of my uh, postdocs to uh, ask them if they're interested. I mean, we have so much data on, on these individuals. Um, we, we could put in this type of questions and, understand better um, what's going on uh, and both uh, from a biological perspective. Yeah. So we can we can go back to more traditional um, look environmental factors that are studied. What did you look at in terms of, of environmental risk factors and protective factors of, of aggression in children? Yeah, well, um, the obvious ones are, are the, the parents. Uh, Mm -hmm. father and, and mother history of problem behavior. Uh, and so it, it's clear that there is a intergenerational transmission, um, both from mothers and from fathers. So for example, mothers, we, we asked them about uh, uh, their behavior during adolescence. And it's clear that the boys and girls who have uh, the more problems with antisocial behavior have uh, parents who, who have problems with antisocial behavior and, and mothers and, and, and fathers. Um, so that, that there is clearly a strong intergenerational link. Um, part of that link is due to um, assortative mating. Uh, so as by assortative mating, we mean uh, that people, uh, a girl will choose a boy and a boy will choose a girl that has similarities in terms of either academic uh, or, or sports interest or, so there's, a lot of dimensions to assortative mating, uh, but there is clearly assortative mating for antisocial behavior. Mm -hmm. So males who have antisocial tendencies and mate with females who, who have similar antisocial tendencies. And it's not surprising that their children, both from a genetic and an environmental perspective will have similar problems mm -hmm. uh, during their lives. Does assortative mating exist outside of, of just the, uh, the social environment? So for example, if, if you grow up in the same low income community, then it's more likely um, that, that people who perform maybe worse academically are more likely to become criminals, yes. might mate together. Yes. But that could be a function of their environment as opposed to Maybe someone moves and they move to a rich town, but they still seek out someone who's, um, if they're delinquent, maybe more delinquent. Yes, the, the assortative mating mechanism is extremely strong. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. it applies to uh, how tall you are, it applies to how heavy you are, <laughs> it applies to uh -huh. uh, blue eyes, it uh, applies to uh, what you like to eat. Uh, mm -hmm. Sort of eating determines many, many different things. And uh, in terms of prevention, from my perspective now, um, it, it's the most important part of um, preventing problems is uh, trying to give support 
from pregnancy onwards uh, to, um, to parents and children who have histories of problem behavior, if we're talking about problem behavior. Mm -hmm. But it's also, true, it's also true for mental illness and for physical health problems. Um, so it's, and it's in, in the field, uh, in, in the medical field, it's become very clear for almost every disease you can imagine. And, and um, lifestyle uh, that um, it, there are these assertive mating intergenerational transmission uh, and that we need to, to do uh, preventive interventions from early pregnancy onwards if, if we want to help those who have uh, the most problems because individuals who are doing very well in life, it's unlikely that they will decide to have children with someone who has big problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so th there is a sort of mating in the positive sense and a sort of mating in the negative sense also. Uh -huh. So it's sort of a snowball effect in either, yes. in either direction. Yes. Well, yes. I guess that, uh -huh. that's interesting because in terms of just behavior, things sort of peak in adolescence, but then after adolescence, you get into to the, the realm of mating and yes. then that's where the inner generational effects come in. Yes, yes, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. So we, if we put all our money into helping those who have big problems, um, uh, there's no money left to help early on. And mm -hmm. early on um, means um, helping from pregnancy onwards. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, gynecologists have an important role to play because they are the ones who see these couples very early in pregnancy. And, mm -hmm. and it's, I mean, it's obvious <laughs> who has problems and who does not have problems. Uh -huh. And so we should have support both from a medical and a social and psychological perspective to the couples um, have histories uh, of um, problem behavior in the past. Mm -hmm. So in terms of maximizing benefit from your intervention studies, is it is it sort of like a squeaky wheel gets the grease thing or is it about reaching as many people as possible? But is it better to target the worst of the worst and hope they get better? Or is it better to target as many people as possible and then some of the worst ones it might not be as effective on? Well, um, uh, to a certain extent, most people um, do not need heavy, <laughs> heavy support. Um, mm -hmm. Early on, um, I mean, we all we need uh, the gynecologists uh, to guide us, but um, I, I think that in most of our societies, it's a minority, but it's a mm -hmm. it's a relatively large minority that yeah. needs uh, important support, and and that's why um, things like uh, giving support during pregnancy and in early childhood and high quality child care mm -hmm. uh, for children, especially of these families, is extremely important. Education, mm -hmm. <laughs> the schooling, everything that concerns education of from pregnancy up to school entry is probably the most important investment we can make mm -hmm. um, in our human resources uh, right. to, uh, to, to solve the, almost every problems that we have. Mm -hmm. So 
we still have to deal with the problem of limited resources. So I'm wondering, would it be better to target one high risk family with, let's say, maybe um, full, full, a full week of high quality daycare, like 40 hours a week, or target four families and give them 10 hours a week, which would have more impact? Um, uh, I it's uh, it's hard for me to see that we can give daycare high quality daycare for only part of the time. <laughs> uh -huh. um, it's um, I mean quality daycare is not that expensive. Mm -hmm. um, prob the, the biggest problem is probably finding enough um, educators, um, daycare educators, to be able to handle um, many people. At, at the moment, uh, there is a problem of training mm -hmm. early childhood educators um, yeah. so that they will give the adequate care. Um, mm -hmm. I guess in a way that's a money problem too, because if you yes. paid them enough, more people would do it. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, but it it's, from my perspective, it, it's a much better investment uh, to pay well for early child care than to try to invest the money later on when you have... Uh, five, 10 years of development that has gone wrong. Um, I mean, changing these trajectories is extremely difficult. Uh, uh, and so um, we are better off to put more resources early on than, than later. Mm -hmm, I agree. I think it would be good to close talking about the present and future of this field. Um, and your, your recent prize in the, the Stockholm Prize in Criminology, it seems like that's been a major shift from talking about criminologists focusing more on societal factors and, and late adolescence as opposed to, well, giving you this award for, for studying early, early development. Yes. Um, yes, the, the, the committee of that uh, Stockholm Prize is very much forward looking. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, it's largely due to uh, the, the, the two persons who, who created the, that prize. Uh, they they, um, they have been selecting people who are sort of marginal in criminology to um, try to show the field of criminology, uh, what are the important uh, things to do in the future? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's, it's an interesting approach. Uh, I guess the Nobel Prize was created in the same way uh, of recognizing a work that is new and, mm -hmm. and important for, for the future. And so from that perspective, um, th there is a, a very strong movement in criminology uh, towards doing um, uh, novel initiatives uh, mm -hmm. in, in terms of, of research. Uh -huh. So it, it, I'm sure you were honored because this was a novel approach, but now does it seem like it's becoming more common to focus on early development in terms of, of preventing um, long, long-term uh, delinquency? Well, um, it, I don't think it is at the moment <laughs> and, and I hope it will become one day, um, but we still have a, a long way. It's, it's true for simply education. The, the field of education is not investing enough in education from pregnancy until uh, um, kindergarten. Um, and so uh, it would be surprising that criminology is more forward looking than, than the education specialist. Uh, 
Uh, mm -hmm. But I think over time it will uh, it will it will be a uh, it it is if you look in Scandinavia. Who, I think we've been talking mainly about North America, at least from my perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if if you look at uh, Scandinavia, uh, we, we can see that they are they are uh, much more advanced than we are in terms of giving the adequate services early on in mm -hmm. life, and it will be an, an advantage for them in the long run. Uh -huh. So to sum up these major points, it looks like we found that whether that's due to, to biological or environmental factors, the most aggressive children by frequency are the youngest children, and it gets better over time. We get socialized out of it. But to maximize our return and to minimize criminality, we need to focus on these very early interventions, such as high quality child care and providing care to to mothers during pregnancy. Wait, f yes, for family, especially for families mm -hmm. with a history of problem behaviors. Great, Dr. Tremblay, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure.